The art of glass blowing was first invented by Syrian craftsmen somewhere along the Syro-Palestinian coast in the first century before the Common Era. At first, glass was blown into molds, which resembled shells, clusters of grapes, and human heads, which was an art form primarily promoted by the establishment of the Roman Empire. By the Middle Ages, Venice had become the major center of glass blowing, which eventually made its way down to the island of Murano. The Venetian glassmakers from Murano produced clear glassware by employing the mold blowing technique. After a period of time, the Syrian gaffers, which is just a term for glass workers, began to execute natural spherical forms without the use of molds. The technique has remained pretty much the same to the present day. The molten glass, which has a consistency similar to molasses, is gathered on the end of a hollow pipe, inflated to a bubble, which then can be formed by swinging it, rolling it on a smooth stone or iron surface, known as a marver, or by cupping it with a wooden cup. Specific shapes can be added with, while the glass is still hot by manipulating it with hand tools such as jacks, tweezers, or shears. Around the 17th century, the gaffer's chair was invented. This is a bench which can be seen in many of the following clips, and it is a chair that features two extended arms on which the pipe can be placed and rolled back and forth so as to preserve symmetry of the molten glass, which has a strong inclination towards gravity. Glassblowing is a craft that has been passed on from master to apprentice or throughout families, um, and the formulas and procedures used in the art form for specific styles has actually had the tradition of secrecy, which for a time had the death penalty for disclosure. So if I disappear, you'll know the reason. But it has nonetheless endured the last 2,000 years through all its transitions and innovations. This is my journey on the glass road. As far back as I can remember, I have always loved glass. There is something so correct about the perfection and cleanliness that it embodies. My first introduction to the art of glass blowing, that was not clear water cups, was when I traveled to Venice when I was in the seventh grade. Here I was able to see so many different styles and forms of glass blowing, and so this became the trip that sowed the seed of my passion for the art form. A particularly fond memory of that trip was visiting the animal glass blowing shop in Venice, where I spent many of my savings on collecting dozens of little figures from a family of pigs to a series of emperor penguins. However, my favorite is this glass turtle. I love the blue in its back. It always seems to capture that magnificence that can be seen in the sea. And a close second favorite is the seagull. So by now, you might notice I like the ocean. When it came to deciding on a senior project, I had a lot of ideas floating around my head, but nothing seemed to find foundation. As I sat staring at my glass turtle and my seagull, it occurred to me I could learn how to blow glass. Of course, there would be a few minor logistical difficulties to that idea, mainly that we were in a global pandemic and glass blowing is not exactly a no contact art form. However, with some time before I had to solidify that decision, I searched Glass Blowing Santa Fe and began the journey. After a few phone calls and emails, things were not looking good. Most places were closed or far too busy to accept me, so it seemed like my glass road was going to be about a foot in length. However, after almost giving up, I discovered Tsuki Glassworks. After browsing around on Google at their pieces, I decided this would be a pretty fantastic place to learn the art, if they would accept me, that is. So I emailed them and didn't hear anything. I called them and left a message, and after some time, things just weren't looking good. But I got a call from Baker, who is one of the artists there, and we discussed the project and my hopes and dreams for the project, and decided that I would be able to join them as an apprentice. So there it was, the glass road had funding, and the outlook was bright. The steps that led to where I am now began with me watching and becoming familiar with the equipment, the process, the studio, and the glass itself. In order to become more familiar with the process, I started 
watching the artists create their pieces, which I filmed for the studio, so they could use the videos in events and on their website. The very first glasswork I watched was the creation of colored rods. These rods are pieces of single colored glass that contain a special mixture created by Baker, which is then sold to other artists to use in their pieces. The artist can take these rods and chip pieces off using a hammer into a dish so that the small shards can be gathered into clear glass, which melts in and takes on the color. What is fascinating about this particular line of color is that they appear differently under different lighting conditions, as you can see here. To better understand the glass making process, I filmed the purple rods being made. The very first step you'll see is the creation of a stirring spoon. Glass is first gathered and then pinched into a paddle. Once this is cool, the pipe is attached to a drill and the paddle is inserted into the cup containing the glass. The glass is stirred so as to maintain consistency and color across the rod. Then, the glass is gathered from a molten state This is then shaped using a wooden cup and a marver. And then is broken off to cool. In order to remove the rod from the pipe, a jack line is made, which can be seen in this clip. And then a couple of drops of water make this connection weak enough so that a tap on the rod can knock the piece into the annealer, which is a controlled environment which decreases in a temperature from around 1000 degrees Fahrenheit to room temperature, allowing the glass to cool slowly so it does not become weak or crack. After watching this process several times, I started taking on different tasks until finally I made a rod by myself. The very first step was to become comfortable rolling the pipe in my hands. This is a very important aspect as the glass has to be continually rotating so that it does not drip off or slag off the end of the rod. Then, when I had this down, I took the rod from Baker after he had gathered some glass and practiced rolling it on the metal table slowly getting the hang of shaping it with pressure and angle. Then I took the step at the bench, practicing cupping it with the wooden cup and the wet newspaper. And by the way, the wood when it starts to smoke from the heat smells amazing, but I wouldn't make it a candle. Finally, I practiced gathering the glass. This proved to be the hardest step for me for a number of reasons. First, the heat which radiates from the furnaces was extremely hot. So hot I could hardly stand by it for more than a few seconds because my arms began to feel the sensation of burning so much I had to walk away. The second was the actual logistics of gathering the glass. In order to gather, you look into the cup that holds the glass and watch for the rod's reflection so you know how far you're going to stick the pipe into it. Then you have to not go too deep so only a little bit of glass is wasted and you also have to twist the rod into the exact angle that you entered the glass so that it does not go unevenly around the pipe. The reason for this is that every time you gather after that, the unevenness is magnified and this can become an issue um, because it can affect the weight but also the symmetry of a piece. My problem was then going in and twisting long enough to get an even coat without walking away from the heat and keeping the exact angle right. But after some time, I started to get the hang of it, although I still do not have the mastery of years and perfection of many of the other artists at Tsuki. After becoming somewhat familiar with the glass, it was time to start the first pieces which I could keep. These pieces were paperweights. The reason for this is they cover all the bases of the basics. Gathering glass, using the marver, using wood cups, using jacks, 
using the glory hole, which is a hot open furnace where you can warm the glass so that you can continue to work with it, gathering color onto a piece, which is done by laying the clear glass into a pile of shards of color, and finally, the ability to creatively experiment. The very first piece I created is this fairly small purple and blue paperweight. In order to gain the spiral appearance, you simply only rotate the pipe in one direction while it's getting heated and while you're moving it. In order to gain the diamond bubble in the top, I pressed the tweezers into the glass, which created a little cavity, and then I gathered clear glass over it, which captured a pocket of air. The second piece I created followed a similar process using more glass this time. In the piece, I also used different colors. However, this time I added a series of twists around the piece using the tweezers, which created bubbles when I gathered clear glass over them. For the record, sticking tweezers into molten glass is among the most satisfying things I've ever experienced in my life. It is almost like playing with honey, except without the stickiness, and it's also quite a bit denser. In my third piece, I repeated the process with a larger bubble in the center by pressing harder with the tweezers. In my fourth piece, I repeated the process again without much change so that I could really focus on gathering the glass properly. In my fifth piece, I gathered clear glass and gathered the color and added some twists with the tweezers, but let it, the glass droop over the end of the piece and then I cupped it back into shape which gained this kind of crazy appearance that was meant to resemble fire in its essence. In my sixth piece, I gathered the glass, but this time I pressed the glass into a textured sheet of many little pyramids. This created a bubble wall, and I also added a few twists so that there were lots of bubbles in the center. I then gathered more clear and a layer of color, and then one more layer of clear in this piece. In my seventh piece, I gathered and repeated the steps for the piece. However, this time I added a larger diamond bubble in the center, and then add the bubble wall, color, and a final coat of clear. This is actually my personal favorite. I really like the colors in this one. In my eighth piece, I repeated the process of gathering glass and adding color, but this time I added some forms to the piece using a knife. This piece is meant to resemble a little meditating figure, and I created it by pressing hard with a knife, starting in the center and moving around to the back. And then I did this again to create the arms. Then I used the knife to cut two slits for the eyes, and then using the tweezers, I pulled a nose out from beneath the eyes, which was very satisfying. Each of these pieces was placed in the annealer, which is the kiln that decreases its temperature with a computer gradually over time so the pieces don't crack or become extremely brittle. On the following day, after each piece was cooled and completed, I ground their bottoms down to be smooth so they would sit evenly on the table or on papers. This was done using a sheet of glass covered in a grit mixed with water. You simply place the piece with light pressure and move it around in circles so that it even out the bottom. This leaves a foggy, kind of foggy texture, and most pieces gained a little ring. In order to master this process, which pretty much every piece must go through at some point, I ground down all the pieces available in the shop. One of the key aspects to better your skills when working with glass is to assist masters. Even if you aren't completing pieces entirely by yourself, you are becoming more familiar with the equipment and the process. And as they say, practice makes perfect. I assisted lots of artists with many of their pieces, such as taking the piece from the bench to the glory hole to heat it back up so as to get used to the pipe and also the glasses dynamics. I also attached punties. This is essentially the process of reattaching the piece to another rod so that you can access the bubble. One of the interesting pieces that I assisted on, that I have on film, is the following. I played a fairly minimal role, but I got to learn a new style of glass blowing. In this, I heated a series of glass rods on a dish so that they could be gathered and melted together into a vase. Here is some of the footage.
Another project I got to assist in was the making of cups. Cups are very popular in the glass world and they have a fairly straightforward process. I worked on these with the owner, Charlie, and it was here I got to blow my first bubble. I started out like I did with the paperweights by taking on different aspects until I was doing the majority of the process. I started out by heating the pieces back up, then attaching the punty so the glass could be open, then holding the wood block so as the glass cup was opened, the rim was even, then blowing the actual bubbles into the glass that would become the opening of the cup. Now while I enjoyed the process of just working with glass in its molten state, adding in bubbles made a whole new interesting aspect for me, which I quite enjoyed. My first surprise was in the difficulty of blowing air into the glass, as it appears incredibly soft, but it did require some huffing. My second surprise was that if you capped the pipe after you blew air into it, the pressure would keep and expand the bubble, so you had to do only one hard breath in order to expand a bubble to the desired size, if you capped it. After getting the basics of bubbles in the mugs, like the procedure after the color rods, I was able to make something which I could take home. The very first bubble item I made entirely by myself was a clear jar. It was very simple. I gathered a little clear glass, shaped it, and then added a bubble and expanded it to the size I desired. This was about the size of a palm. After I completed the bubble, I opened the bubble to make it into a jar. I did this by attaching a punty to the other side of the pipe, and then I broke it off from the pipe, which left a little opening. Sadly, during the night, it cracked and some microfracture from the cooling of the water expanded over time, which made it completely worthless. Nonetheless, I had repeated the exact process again, except this time with color. The piece successfully survived the night, and I have it now. After completing the piece, it was time to grind the bottom down. Unlike in previous times, there was a large piece of glass that came off with the rod so I had to use the grinding machine. This uses a motor which attaches a diamond grit plate magnetically and spins it while water runs over it so it can grind down the glass. I have been working with stained glass since seventh grade and I had worked with this style of grinder on a much smaller scale, grinding the edges of the glass down to attach copper tape for soldering, so I didn't find it too difficult. After this, I took it to the glass plates, each with the decreasing grit level. After some circling, the piece moved down a grit until it was ready to be polished. Using a similar machine to the diamond plate grinder, I was able to polish the glass back to clarity. This machine uses an ultra smooth clay, which is actually used in optometry to make glasses. After a few minutes on this step, I used a small drill with a grinding bit and I signed at the bottom. The piece was complete. Following my looking at bowl, it was time to begin my final piece. When it came to designing my final piece, I took a long time to even come up with any sort of sketch in my mind. I just hoped that something would come to me, and I would make it. 
I did have a somewhat general idea and direction, which was I wanted my piece to be inspired by the Taoist or Buddhist ideals, thoughts, or philosophies, and I wanted it to go to a Taoist or Buddhist temple. The reason is, over the years of my high school career, those communities have given me so much and I wanted to return something. So when the senior project came around and I decided on glass blowing, I thought this would be the perfect opportunity. Then, of course, to give them something, it would be a bit more meaningful if it in some way correlated to the philosophies or religion. So it was not just a random cup on a shelf. Um, so my first thought was of the yin and yang. Manifesting this into glass, of course, would be a bit difficult, so I began to ponder on a way you might see this in nature. The first thought I had was of the sun and moon, but of course those would be a bit more sophisticated than the skills I currently have. Then I thought of flowers. While of course the contrast of flowers would be much less than that of night and day, I thought I could focus on the inseparable aspect of yin and yang. So, I came up with a sketch in which two flowers bloomed on the same stem. This would also serve as a base so the flowers could stand up. One flower would face the sun and one the earth, giving them a bit more contrast than just being separate flowers. When it came to the actual process, it was a bit different than I had done thus far. I did not gather the glass while it was in the state of golden honey, but rather when it was cool marbles of clear glass because the heating furnace was not on at the time. This meant it took a bit longer and required a lot more focus as the glass wasn't quite as hot and so I had less time than I would have had if it had been hotter to work with it. However, after a couple hours and some guidance from Baker, the piece was finished and ready for the annealer. It turned out pretty amazing. The next day when I returned, there was only the grinding process to go. Then I signed it, and the only step left was to find it a home. Throughout the whole process, I knew that portion of the project was going to arrive, but it wasn't until after I completed it did I actively engage in the search. I googled around looking for a Zen place to make it its home, and after some time I found Mountain Cloud Zen Center. I settled on this location after browsing through photos and discovering it was only a hop and a skip down the way from my home. Because of COVID-19, I had yet to visit it before, but I was confident it would make a nice location. So I called them and they said that they would love to take it and to bring it over when I got a chance. So a few hours later, I drove over and met the caretaker. Because of COVID, I was not allowed to enter the meditation and Zen room. However, he promised to find it a nice place on the altar. The location grounds were, however, gorgeous, as I was able to walk around them, and it was incredibly tranquil and pleasant, and I look forward to going and seeing it in the future. As I drove away, I took a right on Old Santa Fe Trail, and I left the glass road behind, which was my journey through glass blowing. Now this amazing journey I have taken down the glass road would not have been possible without my amazing mentors, family, teachers, and friends. First, I would like to thank Baker, one of my mentors, and the mentor who made this journey possible. I would literally not have a project without him. He made sure I was able to come into the studio during a pandemic. He gave me my first lesson, and he taught me the basics of glass work. And he worked with my schedule and ensured that I had a final piece even when the studio was closed. I would also like to thank him for the life lessons and great conversations. I would like to thank Dave, who is another mentor for me. David really helped me to explore the glass and become familiar with it from another viewpoint. I would also like to thank David, particularly for the conversations we had, whether it was about Star Trek, religion, science, life, I thoroughly enjoyed the time. I would also like to thank Jaron Adam, who also served as mentors for me at Tsuki Glass, for just being amazing coaches and inspirers for my passion in the art form. I would also like to thank Charlie for allowing me to come to Tsuki Glass amidst the times and to learn this amazing art form, as well as for teaching it to me. I would like to thank Mr. Schultz as well for guiding me through the project with helpful deadlines and conversations that inspired creativity and accomplishments. I would like to thank my mother and father 
Molly and Woody for supporting me in this project and helping me to accomplish logistical aspects involved. I would like to thank my grandparents, Linda and Edgar, and Ann and Bill, for making it possible for me to go to Boulder, and for me to have a senior project in which I was able to learn glass blowing. I would like to thank my great aunt Ellen for helping me to create a presentation speech and for aesthetic direction advice. I would like to thank Mountain Cloud Zen Center for accepting my final piece and for placing it in such an honorable place. And I would like to thank all of my friends for supporting me through this project, through the highs and lows. Particularly in the tragedies, I would like to thank Alex, Indy, Olivia, Didi, and Karai for listening to my rants. And I would like to thank Karai for coming and filming parts of my project for me. This has been a fantastic experience, and I couldn't have done it without these people. Thank you so much.